you are going to eat three foods today. You have the freedom to choose which food to have for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. So first, you can choose your breakfast. So you decide to have the spaghetti for breakfast. Then you can choose any of the two remaining foods for your lunch, and you decide to have eggs for lunch. Now, you cannot choose your dinner because you must eat the only remaining food, the sandwich. So you, even though there's three meals, you really only have two choices. You have two degrees of freedom in your choice. Let's look at a statistics example of why we care about degrees of freedom. So one common test for categorical data is a chi-squared goodness of fit test. Suppose we have 100 people who must choose their favorite color out of red, blue, or yellow. So there's 100 people. How many choices do I really have when I fill out this table? Well, any number of people between 0 and 100 can like red. So here we said 42 people like red, and we can also choose how many people like blue. 20 people like blue. We've made two choices. However, we have no choice then over how many people like yellow. It must be 38 because these numbers must add up to 100. So you really only have two categories to fill, even though there are three colors. You have two degrees of freedom in your choice. These three numbers are correlated with each other. When one gets bigger, the others get smaller. So when we compute a chi-squared test statistic, where we sum up the observed minus expected data, even though we're adding up three things, it's actually sort of like we're only adding up two, because the remaining one is determined by the rest. Now, of course, we are actually adding up three things, but the fact is they are correlated in some way, and we really don't have a choice over the third item. Uh, one more relevant example here. Degrees of freedom with a known sample mean. So suppose I know that the average of three numbers is five. Well, the first number can be anything. Let's say it's eight. The second number can be anything. Let's say it's three. But we have no choice over the third number. Since the average of these numbers is five, they have to add up to 15. So the third number must be four. We only have two choices, two degrees of freedom. So we have n minus one degrees of freedom, n being the sample size of three here. And why do we care about this? Well, this relates to estimating the variance. So suppose we want to estimate the variance. If we knew what the true mean mu was, then we could use this formula up here to estimate the variance. Now, this isn't a formula we often use because we often really don't know what mu is we often estimate the true mean with the sample mean. However, each xi, each data point, is actually used to calculate that x bar. And what that means is that each xi is closer to x bar than we would expect it to be because xi was actually used to compute x bar. So this means that the sum on the bottom here is actually artificially small compared to the original sum on top. And this is why we use n minus 1 in the denominator of calculating variance to compensate for this, to make it an unbiased estimator. So in terms of this sum, it is not like we are really adding up all n things from the top sum. Each one is smaller than in the top sum. So it's sort of like we are only adding fewer than n terms. In some sense, it's sort of like we are adding n minus 1 terms, because the last term is determined by the other ones. So this is not at all obvious that it's actually like adding up n minus 1 terms. The proofs that this is true involve a lot of algebraic manipulation. But we want to think about it this way because we want to focus on the fact that we are only concerned about degrees of freedom because it determines how large the statistic will be, and thus what probability distribution we should use. So how do the degrees of freedom change when we estimate more parameters? So let's look at the sum of the squared residuals in multiple regression. In regression, the sum of the squared errors or residuals measures the deviation of the data yi from the predictions y hat i. If we predicted the data using only the sample mean and no other predictors, we are only estimating one parameter. This is like when we calculated variance. And this has n minus 1 degrees of freedom. Now we could use simple linear regression to predict y, which estimates two parameters, the intercept and the slope. This would give us even better predictions and even smaller residuals than just using the mean. So this sum is going to be even smaller than above. We're adding up n things still, but they're smaller than we expect, so it's sort of like we're only adding up n minus two things. There are n minus two degrees of freedom. And if we do multiple regression and add another predictor variable, we are estimating three parameters. So this gives us even better predictions and even smaller residuals, so we subtract another degree of freedom, n minus three. And if we kept going, and if we estimated n parameters, then we can perfectly 
fit align to the data. And if we perfectly fit align to the data, all the residuals will be zero. So even though we're adding up n things, it's sort of like we're really adding up zero things because they're going to add up to zero, zero degrees of freedom. So we've seen all these examples of adding up these sums of squares. And when we add up a sum of squares in statistics, that often will follow something called a chi-squared distribution. How big these sums are depends on how many things we are adding up. But it also depends on how dependent each element of the sum is, which is what we've been seeing. So what's really important is effectively how many things we are adding up after taking into account this dependence, not the actual number of things that we add up. And because of this dependence, it's like we are adding up fewer than n things. And we call this the degrees of freedom. When we add up more things, we have to use a probability distribution, which tends to be bigger, which corresponds to a chi-square distribution with higher degrees of freedom. And again, more refers not just to the number, but also accounting for how dependent they are. So the question is, do we really have to interpret every parameter like degrees of freedom anyways? Do we really have to completely understand everything about what it means in every context? And I'd like to give you my perspective on the importance here by talking about normal distributions. So a normal distribution is defined by the mean and the standard deviation or the variance. Now, the standard deviation and variance are not the easiest things to interpret. They are the average squared deviation from the mean, which is sort of weird to talk about in terms of squared units, and the square root of that, which is sort of like the average deviation from the mean, but not exactly. So most people, when they hear standard deviation, they aren't really thinking that hard about exactly what it means. They just know that it somehow measures the spread of the distribution. So you don't need to understand the exact definition of standard deviation or variance as long as you enter the right number into your computer that allows you to calculate probabilities correctly. So, for instance, here, we see what is the probability of being between negative 1 and 1? Well, if we have a distribution with sigma equals 1, that is going to be a different answer than when we have sigma equals 1 half. And understanding this doesn't require that we know the exact definition of sigma. It just relies on the fact that we need to be able to use these numbers in our calculations. So we talked about chi-square distributions, and in any introductory statistics class, degrees of freedom always refers to the degrees of freedom of a chi-square distribution. And you might say, well, that's not true. I know other distributions with degrees of freedom, like a t-distribution. So when we calculate a t-statistic like this, the sample standard deviation s is really just standing in as an estimate of the true standard deviation sigma. And we know the distribution of s is related to a chi-squared distribution. We've already talked about how the sample variance uh, is related to a chi-square distribution because it is a sum of squares. And how close is s to sigma? So how close is our estimate of the standard deviation to the real standard deviation? Well, that's going to depend on the sample size, and it will certainly be more accurate if we have a higher sample size. So the distribution of s depends on n, as we've already talked about. That's the degrees of freedom. So since the distribution of s depends on the sample size, so does the distribution of t, because t involves s. And the degrees of freedom of the t distribution is n minus 1. And all that really refers to is the fact that the underlying chi-square distribution has n minus 1 degrees of freedom. Okay, So the t distribution is really downstream from the chi-square distribution. And in regression, we said the degrees of freedom for regression is n minus p, where p is the number of coefficients, including the intercept. Well, the degrees of freedom of what distribution? Well, if we are estimating the variance of the residuals, that follows the chi-square distribution with n minus p degrees of freedom. We are also estimating the regression coefficients. These slopes, they follow t distributions with n minus p degrees of freedom. And sometimes we can even estimate the fit of the entire model. Uh, and this is often called ANOVA, and it relies on something called an F distribution, which is a ratio of two variances. So each sample standard deviation S is related to a chi-square distribution, which has a degrees of freedom parameter. And so the distribution of F2 will be affected by the degrees of freedom associated with S1 and S2. Are there any more places where degrees of freedom are used? So most people doing basic statistics will only ever see degrees of freedom when using chi-square distributions or t distributions or f distributions, which again are just downstream from chi-square distributions. And when these distributions don't really apply, people have tried to apply the idea of degrees of freedom to other problems. And these are usually approximations or analogies. So one example we might see in an introductory statistics class is a two-sample t-test, uh, when we do an unpooled two-sample t-test. 
Okay, so we calculate our test statistic like this for a two sample t test. And this has a incredibly complicated degrees of freedom. Okay, so obviously, this formula is so complicated, there's no way I would even want to think about how to interpret this number perfectly. Um, this number is not even going to be an integer. Um, so it's going to be very hard to interpret. This formula, this degrees of freedom formula allows us to get a good approximation for the purpose of computing probabilities. Okay, so mathematicians have proved that this distribution over here, approximately follows a t distribution with this degrees of freedom, and that that gives us good approximations to probabilities that we are interested in computing. It's not important to interpret it because it's just an approximation. And in an introductory statistics class, we're not really even going to use that formula because that number is usually just approximated uh, with a simpler formula or computed with technology. Uh, people have tried to use the degrees of freedom in even more contexts, more modern statistics concepts. So people have tried to generalize the concept to new models like lasso. In regular linear regression, degrees of freedom is related to the complexity of the model. We said we subtract one degree of freedom for each parameter we estimate. So in, in some sense, the degrees of freedom is related to this idea of overfitting the model, because the more parameters we add, the more degrees of freedom we subtract. And the overfitting of the model can also be captured by the correlation or the covariance between our predictions and the data. So we don't have to think about this too hard, but the point is they have tried to generalize this idea of degrees of freedom uh, for other contexts that might be useful. Um, so this was created for the lasso. Uh, but even the top statisticians making these new methods seem a little bit skeptical of this phrase. Uh, for instance, uh, there was one paper called Effective Degrees of Freedom, a flawed metaphor expressing skepticism of this idea. And uh, even the creators of the lasso uh, ha have a paper called On the, quote, Degrees of Freedom of the Lasso. So the takeaway here is you're not going to learn much by understanding the, quote, true concept of degrees of freedom. Instead, we want to focus on the fact that it determines how big certain random variables are by factoring in how many things we are adding and how dependent they are, and thus which probability distribution you're going to use to compute p-values or confidence intervals. Thanks for watching. Please like and subscribe to learn more statistics.